Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe. Today's episode is the sequel to that first morality philosophy episode involving the Conan analysis. Well, the analysis of Conan the Barbarian. I analyzed the main theme and philosophical point that underpins the Conan stories, which in that case was valor and chivalry and to an extent ambition. This episode is going to be more about Dragonlance and its moral underpinnings. The main virtue I could see here is temperance, which is a term that means mercy, but also balance and self-restraint. It is a very important virtue. It involves being both in harmony and capable of maintaining harmony and showing restraint and compassion. Why do I think that this is the main virtue that underpins the Dragonlance universe. Well, it's that the reason I asked this question in this way is to just get you thinking a little. Now let's kind of answer my own question here. The thing with showing mercy is that you see it in Huma's story. Huma shows mercy time and time again. He shows self-restraint, keeps from killing Tachesis, knowing that destroying her would unbalance everything. The thing about Dragonlance is it works with a yin-yang type of universal structure. Everything is reliant upon the balance between light, darkness, and gray, kind of neutrality there. With neutrality acting like kind of the scales and light and darkness being weighed, the trouble is when one side gets to be a little too heavy, it throws the other off the scale. This balance between light and darkness is also within each individual. Everyone has this temptation that they face, which is pretty true to life. We all face the darkness in different ways. We're also sometimes blinded by our own ego, by our own kind of light, or we take pride in that we are capable of. For example, you may be good at sports and you may get blinded by the skills you demonstrate and then you'll just, I don't know, screw it up or you'll trip at the wrong moment when someone's telling you, well, you were flying too close to the sun there, slow down. And you have the darkness, your greed, your gluttony, your lust, your pride, your wrath. You get the picture, your sloth, everything, and your darker side. You need to balance them because, for example, greed can be a good thing. Wanting more in life for yourself, wanting more for those around you, wanting more love, wanting more friendships, more greater accomplishments. Wanting more can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. So you need to balance that with self-restraint, with knowing when to stop while you're ahead. Huma exemplifies this kind of ideal. He's perfect, essentially. He's a very messianic character, especially if you look at temperance, mercy, and restraint as the primary virtues to look to for guidance. If you look at Raceland, he's interesting. He is at times merciful, but lacks a lot of self-restraint, but at other times has too much self-restraint. He does not allow himself to love and be loved because he's afraid. The thing is, he does, however, show mercy to Bupu and continuous compassion, but he's unrestrained in his passion for his magic. It leads him down a dark path. He at times shows too much self-discipline, too little at other times. He's a weird dichotomy. Raceland is one of the most complex fantasy characters of all times. He's almost Tolkienian in his complexity and in his depth, and there's a great deal to to discuss about him. What is more is you have other characters such as Tannis who oftentimes lacks mercy, lacks self-restraint. He lacks mercy towards Raceland whom he ought to show more compassion to than anyone alive should. He's seen this kid grow up but he has no compassion, no pity for him. He ought to show a bit more. But on the other hand, he shows considerable compassion and pity and mercy, many of those he runs into. That said, he lacks self-restraint. I mean, just look at the entire Kitsiara incident at the end of Chronicles. When he indulges too much, he ends up trying to make Raceland pay the price for that, which shows a certain lack of self-restraint that continues up until he realizes just how much Kitsiara is using him. And then he turns it around, pledges himself to Lorana, which... I'll be honest, I really like that moment in the series as it showcases that Tannis has finally, he's finally become what he should be, what he was meant to be. You have in turn the internal struggle of Caramon between his love for his brother and his hatred for him as he hates and despises Raceland, but he also loves him. He despises him for being willing to kill him in the test. But on the other hand, he loves him because they're twins, they're brothers. 
So you have this constant internal struggle. But you also have the external struggle between the forces of light and darkness. You have Paladin, who's very self-aware of this need for balance, can't seem to communicate the importance of it to Tachesis, who has no regard whatsoever for the balance. She has no regard. She just wants to corrupt and destroy everything around her. I would argue she goes a great distance towards doing this. Prequel era, throughout the Age of Dreams, throughout, you have the time when the King Priest shows up, I would say Tachesis was playing a bit of a role in that she's more subtly corrupting things at the edges. You have the king priest who is blinded by his own ego, by his own greatness, one could say, and he becomes obsessed with light, but he doesn't regard Paladin as a source of light, but as an obstacle to the light that he thinks is within himself, when in reality, he's overcome by the darkness, so to speak. I'd argue he's probably inadvertently worshipping Tachesis, and I know that's a weird reading of the text, but it's fascinating what he's doing what he's thinking and there's a bit of a king priest of istar in each of us he's mad he's perverted he's horrible he's fanatical and we need to balance our pride with temperance with self-discipline with self-compassion but also compassion for others mercy we need this and that's the thing that king priest did not understand did not know how to show to the world around him. when he says forgive me paladin king priest puts it in his own words Palado Kalib, forgive me, which even Paladin tells Beldinus, no, because Beldinus went too far. Now, if you've read the one short story, which I forgot the title of, and which I read years ago, and I'm still makes my skin crawl, where we see what would have happened had he become a god, we see the depths of the depravity within the King Priest of Istar. How oh, there is no mercy, there is no restraint within him so that Paladin, who is probably the most forgiving deity in all of fantasy fiction, could not bring himself to forgive this monster, which that's what Beldinus is. He was a monster in human flesh. I'm not trying to be unrestrained there, but there's something profoundly sickening about his brand of evil. The only one who seems to have been amused by it are Feast on Dantilus and Tachesis, which T Feast on Dantilus is essentially the opposite of temperance. He's gluttonous. He has no restraint, and he destroys and devours everything that's close at hand. He has no mercy. We could even look at why Raceland falls. It's because Parcellion has no compassion or mercy for him. Parcellion does not understand the concept of self-restraint, of self-discipline. And he punishes Raceland when he ought to have forgiven him. If he had forgiven him, I would argue that would yield far greater results. It would teach Raceland compassion. The moment when Raceland needed compassion the most, and the most amount of mercy and pity, was after the test. But he's shown none. He's shown no quarter. So he learns to show no quarter. In a lot of ways, his fall can be laid entirely at the door of Antimedes and Barsalian for being as cruel as they were towards him. You look at those who managed to triumph over those around them. You look at Kif Kanan. He continuously shows compassion. A little too much at times. But ultimately, why does he become remembered in history as a great leader? Because he constantly shows mercy. He shows self-discipline. He knows when to temper compassion with discipline. This is temperance. Same with Huma. He's the most worshipped character in Dragonlance for a reason. Stern Brightblade gets a, a lot of worship. He may be one of my favorite characters, but let's give him some due criticism. He is cruel towards Raceland for a long time. He's cruel to those weaker than himself. He acts like Derek Crownguard towards Raceland. But then, in the Chronicles, you see him learn. You see him grow. And so by the time his life comes to an end, he's full of compassion, of remorse, of pity. We see him become the champion and the hero we always knew he could be. Heck, even in Dragons of Winter Night at the beginning, he demonstrates when he's joking with Raceland and when he shows a lot of compassion towards Alhana Starbreeze, even though she can be harsh towards him, he tolerates it. But at the same time, he puts her in her place and says, listen, I don't deserve your abuse. I will protect you. I will help you. You are a lady. I am a knight. I have a duty. But a, li a little gratitude here. And she chastened, says, okay, I'm sorry. And she shows a lot of self-discipline and self-restraint, tempers her anger with compassion and gratitude and says, thank you for helping me. Best of luck. And, you know, they, they kind of have their weird non-relationship. Both very fascinating characters. They're too much alike in some ways. This sense of temperance, this underpins the entirety of Dragonlance. Now in Conan, the idea is the kingdom of ends. But I'd argue that Dragonlance looks to the notion of Marcus Aurelius where you must form yourself as the promontory and absorb the blow of the crushing sea or the crushing waves of the sea. And I really like this stoic philosophical outlook on life. The notion that, you know, stiff upper lip to an extent, but primarily you absorb the blow while it is within your power 
be good. Just that simple sentence right there is also something that underpins Dragonlance. If Conan represents Immanuel Kant's Kingdom of Ends philosophy, Dragonlance represents the philosophy of absorbing the blow and letting go of your anger and accepting those around you and knowing when to show compassion and pity and mercy and being good while it is within your power. That is what I would argue the philosophy of Dragonlance is. And this is why Dragonlance, I think, will continue to be read for many years to come and why it should continue to be read. The notion of temperance and of self-restraint and compassion and mercy is very important. This is a very important idea of philosophy and it's a reframing of Marcus Aurelius's Stoic philosophies. The reframing of this school of thought, so to speak, into a story is something I think Wace and Hickman did kind of on some level, if not consciously, at least unconscious. And next time we'll be dealing with Tolkien's main virtue and philosophy behind his universe. Don't forget to tell me what you think of this video. Like, smash that subscribe button like your sky trying to smash Sturm to itty bitty pieces.